<laughs> Leslie asked about the timing when the homework is due. The homework for tonight should be due. That is homework 01 that is no physics, just how do you use the website, should be due at like 11.55 tonight. But the homework two that's due on Friday should be at 8.05 p.m. And uh, the reason for that is I don't want you doing your homework on the Sabbath. And so the Friday homework is due between five and 10 minutes before sundown to make sure that you can't be doing it on the Sabbath still. So that should be the case. Are you saying that homework one no, is that? Like um, you said the other day it was due at 1055, right? Five minutes before class and it's, but I checked it says 855 AM. It must be a time zone issue. I put them all in at 1055. Oh, okay. um, and I'm pretty sure I had it Chicago, but I'll double check. Because it is eight, it's eight oh five p.m. is when the homework is due on Friday. That's what I thought you were referring to. Okay, um, lab took for most people about twenty minutes longer than the lab period. I apologize. That's obviously not the goal. I, I know we had the test thing, we had the, the little lecture thing, and so you didn't get started on the lab. Well, we lost an hour at the beginning before we had the pre-lab lecture. But I will try to do better. I thought I had done better by cutting stuff out, but I didn't cut out enough. What was the biggest time sink for the lab? Scientific method. The scientific method thing, because you were trying to figure out how it works. And I hope that you have a pretty good idea of how it works now so that it doesn't take so long in the future. But for the next lab, think about the scientific method thing you want to do beforehand so hopefully we can make it go a lot quicker because that's, you know, that that's the part that's the real thinking you have to do during lab is how exactly am I going to do this scientific method thing? And I want it to become something where you start thinking about how a hypothesis is actually designed and how you can test them. That's a goal there. Any questions about lab or the first day of class? No. What did we learn in the first day of class? that was physics related. <laughs> okay, that came in the lab. The answer was unfortunately nothing. I only talked about the syllabus. Um, it was in the lab where we had that make sure you use the right units thing. And so that's why I'm gonna pick up today. So we're gonna actually have our first, well, we had real physics there in lab where we learned about uncertainty estimates. It's always important to have units and if you make a measurement, uncertainty in science. So let's get started. So the first thing I have here, we're going to talk about the definitions of words. <laughs> there are words that we use in physics that have very specific meanings as compared to the words we use in everyday life. For example, work. When I say work, okay, I saw you working this morning, right, Leslie? What were you doing at work this morning? Making sure things were provided in the micro lab. Making sure things were provided in the micro lab. Earning a paycheck or some other such thing. In physics, work is very specific. Work is a force that is making something move. So we have a very specific meaning in physics for a word that in general life we have a different meaning. So here's an example, speed and velocity. You'll hear those used all the time. People want to sound intelligent and say velocity. What's the difference in speed and velocity? I mentioned it kind of in passing last class period. Most of you probably know, so I'm not going to throw it out there as a question and have some people say, well, how would I know that? I haven't studied it before and other people know it. And, you know. Velocity is speed with direction. If you have a magnitude, how big the number is, and a direction, we call that a vector. So velocity is a vector. Actually, I think it was in the 251 class that I talked about, not in the other people didn't get me talking about this. So velocity is a vector, it has both speed and direction. Speed is a scalar. It only has a magnitude. There's only how fast you're traveling, not the direction. So velocity is a vector which means magnitude, okay, that's a G, 
magnitude with direction. Whereas speed, what we call speed is a scalar. Notice it's two A's for the scalar. It's not something that removes scales. It's a different word. And the scalar means it only has magnitude, only how big the number is, not a direction for it. You still have units with that magnitude. So that's the difference in speed and velocity. And that's a big part of the topic for the day is understanding how speed works. Then we have mass and weight. And this is one that really gets me going, okay? Mass, there's actually two definitions of mass that as far as we can tell, they come out to be exactly the same thing, so we usually just say mass. But the two definitions of mass, one is inertia, a measurement of how much inertia an object has. The other one is a measurement of how the force of gravity interacts with an object. And so sometimes they'll say an inertial mass or gravitational mass. But as I said, as far as we know, there is no difference whatsoever in the two. So saying mass is plenty fine. Fundamentally, mass is a measure of how much stuff is present. And so it's a fundamental concept. We have to have units for things. And so for mass, we're going to have a unit. The fundamental unit is the kilogram. Kilo is a prefix that means a thousand. This is a really odd one because the fundamental unit has a prefix. A kilogram is the fundamental unit for mass. <clears throat> How much stuff is present? Weight is the force of gravity on an object. So weight here, I changed my color of pin again. Uh, no, I won't change the color of pin. I'll accidentally choose to go to a completely different slide that's halfway through the lecture. Does that work for everyone? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a good move. Okay, so now I'll change the color of the pin. So mass is how much stuff is present. That's FF. In kilograms, KG is the abbreviation for kilogram. G is the abbreviation for gram. K means kilo. And then if we compare that to missed, to weight, weight is force of gravity. In Newtons, they're so different. <laughs> they're different measurements. They have different units. A force is anything that pushes or pulls. Not something you have to worry about today, something you'll have to worry about in a week and a half or so. So weight is how much it pushes or pulls. Mass is how much is present. Completely different. So why is this such a big deal to me that I have to make a five minute talk about it? Because if you are on the surface of the earth, the force of gravity is just proportional to your mass. It's 9.8 times your mass. So oftentimes people start to get sloppy and they say, well, if it's one kilogram, it's gonna weigh 9.8 newtons every time, as long as you're on the surface of the earth. And so they'll start saying, well, it weighs one kilogram. That's wrong, it can't weigh one kilogram has a mass of one kilogram that weighs 9.8 newtons. But it's become so commonplace that when you step on a scale, the scale either reads your weight in units that are not the, the standard science unit, it reads in pounds, right? My wife and I were comparing our weights last night. I'll just say that I'm less than half her, or she's less, <laughs> I'm less than twice her weight. Yeah, that would have been bad. These are big ones. Yeah, he's a good one. No, no, she's in the 
fine way. I'm the one that's not in a fine way. This list is for me. Yeah. I probably could edit it out. It's okay. But we measured our weights in pounds. But sometimes you like go to the doctor's office and you'll step on their little balance. And what does it measure your weight in? Sometimes you'll say, yeah, you weigh 95 kilograms or whatever. I wish. Um, <laughs> so that's not right. And usually the scale, if it's a scale, it's actually measuring your weight. It's measuring how much force you're pushing down on. And so it should be giving it in units of newtons or pounds. And the kilogram is calculated assuming that you're standing on the surface of the Earth. If you went to the moon, the acceleration of gravity is about one-sixth of what it is on the Earth. So if I step on a scale that reads perfectly on the moon, it's going to read one-sixth of the weight I have on Earth. Is that an incorrect weight? No. It's my weight on the moon. But if it were to read kilograms, it would read one-sixth of the number of kilograms I have on Earth. That wouldn't be right. Because it's the same knee, the same mass. My mass would be the same on the moon. My weight is different. Because they're different things. So now I've spent probably, well, it could have been 10 minutes, but a lot of time on that just to try to emphasize they're two distinctly different things. All right. So let's talk about units. <laughs> a naked number, a number without units, is pretty useless. And, of course, you have to know what the unit means. So this little graphic, it has distances measured in cables. Are cables a legitimate <laughs> distance length? I don't know my uh, units for, oh, I can't even remember words anymore. You know those people who go surveying, yeah. I, they have chains, I don't think they have cables as a unit. And so you look at that picture and you would guess, well, a cable's probably on the order of, I don't know, between one and 50 miles, you know. Not very useful if you don't know what the unit is. And so we need to have units there. There should be standard units that everyone's going to know. So standard units. We have very basic things. Fundamental unit is time. And everyone on Earth, thankfully, agrees in what we should use for our fundamental base unit of time. And that is the second. And, of course, what is the second? We have to have something that the second means. We can't just all say seconds and not know what it means. <clears throat> or so modern science says. So in 1967, and I will point out, I was maybe a year old when this came out, depends on what time of year. Scientists decided that they could define a second in a nice reproducible manner. A second is the time it takes for 9,192,631,770 cycles of the radiation given off by cesium for, well, a hyperfine, a specific hyperfine transition in cesium. Now, this, I know, means virtually nothing to you. But what is important, the reason I have it up there, is because it's reproducible. Any lab on Earth, if they have cesium and they have the ability to measure the emission spectrum from the cesium, they can get this and they can calibrate for what a second is. In 1997, and I will point out I was a college teacher at that point, this was updated to say for cesium at rest at zero kelvins. Now zero, you probably approach zero kelvins, but super cool cesium. So it's something that can be reproduced anywhere on Earth, so you don't have to have a standard for a second you can always recalibrate if you have the right equipment. We don't have the right equipment here. Somebody had a question? Oh, no, you pretty much okay. Okay, so that's time, the second. Everything else is derived from that. We have, you know, seconds, minutes. Minutes are, well, a second is 1 60th of a minute, and a minute is 1 60th of an hour. 24 hours in a day. What's a day, by the way? I went over this astronomy last night. Context for the Earth is being once around its axis. 
that is the definition of a sidereal day. A sidereal day is a day as measured by the stars. So one rotation is a sidereal day. A sidereal day is just a little bit less than 24 hours. None of us say, oh, a day is a little less than 24 hours. We always say a day is 24 hours. So what is the mean solar day? Sundown to sunset. Um, you could say it's the average time from sunset to sunset. I think we usually say it's the average time from noon to noon because noon to noon is a little more reproducible. It still varies, by the way. It's not always 24 hours from noon to noon. But the time from sunset to sunset is going to have more variation than the time from noon to noon. But that's right. You have to have a demarcation measuring the time from there to there. Why are the two different, uh, Clay? Why are the two different? I'm asking him because I went over it last night, so there's a chance he'll remember. Uh, there's also a chance he won't, of course. That's it. <laughs> yeah, the Earth is both rotating and orbiting around the sun. And so in the time that it takes for the Earth to do one complete rotation, it's orbited approximately 1 365th of a circle. And so it has to do approximately 1 365th more than one rotation to go from day to day. And so that's why the solar day is not the same as the sidereal day. Okay, that was not intended to be part of my lecture, but since I'm teaching astronomy, you know, I'm just... Okay, so going off on another tangent, we'll finish class, trust me. Um, by the way, if it gets to being, um, well, if it gets to being 11.35 and I don't stop, remind me to, okay, because we have a problem for you to do, in case I'm not um, Why are there 360 degrees in a circle? Right, you probably all learned that as a child, right? So instead oh, of not why. Or something like that, now they learned how to calculate it. It, it comes from 360 is close to 365. There are 365.2422 days in a year. That is 365.2422 mean solar days, 366.2422 scenario days in a year. So 365.24. That was actually well known to anyone who was a scientist way back in the day. They had built up all the knowledge we had, but if you're interested in looking at nature, remember you observe something interesting and then you try to hypothesize why that occurred. Well, they're looking out there and they're observing something interesting that the seasons appear to repeat every 365 and quarter days. Now, these ancient guys were in the numerology apparently, and they said, you know, 360 is kind of close to 365 and a quarter, and it's magical. It's magical because you can divide 360 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, got to skip 7, 8, 9, 10, got to skip 11, and 12. So all the two, all the two numbers between 1 and 12 will evenly divide 360. It's like this number is really powerful. You decide to make a math easy. And so they said, let's take the distance that the sun moves with comparison to the stars, and that's going to be one degree. And sure, we've got a little bit of error because of the 365 versus 360. So basically, a degree is the distance the sun moves in the sky each day if you thought that the sun was going around the Earth and the Earth was stationary. OK, so that was in no way relevant to today's class. It will come up later in the semester. Second unit, distance. Once again, Everybody's got some idea of distance. The unit we use is the meter. It's a good unit. If we were to go back in time, we had units like the foot. How long is a foot? There you go. As long as I'm the king. Now, if I get dethroned and Leslie becomes the queen, the foot's going to shrink because her foot is not as long as mine. Probably not a great unit to just take somebody's body measurement and make that the definition. My understanding is, you know, the foot was the length of foot of a ruler and like a yard was distance from nose to fingertips. And, you know, it, it was kind of oddly defined. The meter was initially defined as one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator along the prime meridian. Of course, the surveyors weren't right in their measurement of that distance, so the meter is not really one ten millionth of that distance, but it was a shot. 
The meter has subsequently, this was in 1983, when I was either a junior or senior in high school, defined as the distance light travels in 1, 2, 9, 9, 7, 9, 2, 4, 5, 8 of a second. Now, that, that basically means the speed of light is considered a constant of nature. The speed of light is 299792458 meters per second. It kind of annoys me. This was 1983. Okay, we weren't in the dark ages then. We had color TVs the whole nine yards. They could have very easily made that number 300 million. No one would have noticed the difference. But no, they had to stick with the closest representation to the random specification they had. Up until 1983, the meter was the distance between two notches on a platinum iridium bar that was kept in a museum. That was the, the actual definition. If you want to make sure your meter stick was right, you had to go to that museum, get access to that bar, and check against it. No one would have known if they just made the number 300 million, but no. Now they had to stick with what they knew best, the distance between those marks. Okay. Now the mass. The mass is a kilogram, and that's the definition of a kilogram, right there in the picture. It's another piece of platinum iridium. Its mass is defined as a kilogram. If you want to check your standard for mass, you have to go and get access to that, which nobody can get, right? Because it's the standard. You can't just have people go and mess around with it. You might notice that it's contained inside a double wall vacuum chamber. You have here's a bell jar, and that's pumped down. And then separately, here's another bell jar, and that's pumped down so that they have no atmosphere in there. And the platinum iridium is chosen because it is very stable. It doesn't have very high vapor pressure. I mean, metals shouldn't have a high vapor pressure to begin with, but they want to be as you know clear as possible. And yet, the most recent recent remeasurement of that seems to indicate that it's changing. And so scientists are really baffled. We Scientists are trying to develop a better definition of what a kilogram is. But right now, that's it. It's the mass of that chunk. So those are our standards for the three basic things. There are only like six basic things. And those are three. Those are going to dominate our lives for this semester. The units that we use, you notice we didn't have the foot, we didn't have the mile, didn't have the pound. We use the metric system, which officially is the Système International des Unités, or something like that, because I don't speak any of those languages. I'm pretty good at English. I can speak a little Japanese, maybe a little German, and that's it. We just call it the SI system for short. SI for System International. And so our base units that we're talking about that we're going to use in physics all the time are the, the metric units, as we often say. So here's a list of all of the fundamental units. I don't know why time is not space the same as everything. But we have length, unit is meter, symbol is M. Mass, kilograms, kg, time, seconds, S. These three, we're going to heavily study this semester. We will also study these two, temperature, which has its base unit, the Kelvin. That's its SI unit. And the amount of the substance, the mole. I don't know why you know, the molecule or atom is not there, but it's the mole. We will not at all cover the candela. You see an asterisk. Probably recognize, yeah, it's probably not much. Second semester... That's an N. Don't want people to think I put second. Second semester, we'll learn about electric current. And it's kind of surprising. Electric charge is not considered the fundamental unit electric current is. And the reason for that is because it's a reproducible measurement for current that's easy to do anywhere on Earth. So those are the fundamental units. Well, I was talking earlier today about the Newton. The Newton is not up there. The Newton's what we call a derived unit. It's a unit that's made up of other things. So a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. 
has abbreviation of capital N, but notice when you write out the unit Newton, you write it with the lowercase n. If you talk about the man, Sir Isaac Newton, you use the capital N. If you talk about the unit named after him, it's a lowercase n. So our unit of force is named after the man. It's derived based on kilograms, meters, seconds. By the way, good trivia question. Anybody know what the standard unit for mass is in the imperial system, the one that uses pounds? Very rare for somebody to know this. But I did have someone last year, I believe, who knew it. It's the slug. So kilograms, slugs, there's a conversion factor, but those are both measuring mass. Newton's pounds, both measuring force. Okay, quick models, theories, and laws. A model is an explanation. It doesn't have to be correct, but it helps you visualize. So the planetary model was a model of the atom, <laughs> the one that I believed was correct until I went to college. That is the idea that electrons orbit around the nucleus and the electrons, like if they're an S shell, that they're doing circular orbits. I bet some of you still thought electrons did circular orbits if they're S orbitals. But that's not true. But that's the planetary model that we have them doing these orbits around the nucleus like planets around the sun. What's the actual shape of its motion? The answer is we have no clue, none whatsoever. Part of the reason quantum physics was developed was the frustration in we can't find out anything about the path the electron takes as it orbits the nucleus. And so one group said, well, forget it then. Since that's unknowable, look, we'll look at what's known. They developed quantum mechanics. But that's a model to help you understand what's going on. It's, it was so successful, we still talk about it. So students in high school, school still learn this planetary model, even though we know it's wrong. Okay, next, a theory. We had hypotheses that we made in class yesterday. What's a hypothesis? It's a guess. It's an educated guess. It's not made in vacuum, but it's just a guess. A theory is a hypothesis that's, that's been tested enough that people have some faith in it. And then a law is a theory that is very broad. It works in a very broad range and usually can be written as an equation. Now, I see I'm going to stop lecturing here in less than 10 minutes, so I've got to speed my stuff up. How scientists go about explaining things I have two slides and 23 clicks. <laughs> hey, read ideas, test. Okay, I just, I've got to speed up. The scientific method that we are essentially doing in lab, we observe something interesting, that's why you have the observation. Then we develop a hypothesis that explains why the observation occurred, right? A lot of you, I, you know, I had to reinforce different aspects of this life. Your hypothesis needs to explain why your observation occurred. And it has to be based on scientific ideas. You can't just say, it happens. You have to have something of why. People had things like, well, because gravity is putting a constant force on it. We haven't talked about force yet. But, I mean, hey, it's true. So what am I going to do? Say, no, you can't use that? <laughs> and that's scientific knowledge you have. And then it needs to make predictions that you can test. And there was our little contrived aspect. The test was already defined. You were going to compare the time to fall one meter to two meters. By the way, what were the correct times if you were measuring absolutely right? Oops, I actually wanted to stop there. To fall one second, the standard, the time should have been 0.452 seconds. To fall two seconds, it should have been 0.639 seconds. Most people are well short of those two numbers. One of our goals yesterday was to look at errors. Why would most people be short? Usually, you're sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. They drop it, you start it, but you have a pretty good delay between when they drop it and when your reaction time is. When it hits the ground, it's coming down and you're anticipating, you know, hey, that's gonna hit the ground soon, I better be ready. I'm going, so I'm gonna hit it right when it hits the ground. So usually you have your reaction time delay here and much less delay here because you can anticipate it, which makes your time shorter than reality. 
when I do this experiment, I watch to see when it's dropped and then I close my eyes. And when I hear it hit the ground, then I hit it. So it tries to get me closer to the same reaction time delay for both. So what a goal yesterday was to understand sources of error. Hence that review. Okay. So after you test your hypothesis, you have two options. Either it passed, in which case you go back and test again a different way. Obviously we won't be doing that in the lab because it'd take forever. Or if it fails, you go back and modify the hypothesis. Last slide before I talk about my new material for four minutes, accuracy versus precision. Accuracy means you're close to the target. Precision means you're reproducible. Reproducible doesn't always mean close to the target. And so when we're measuring our errors, this here, they all have a pretty big error, but if you just look at the standard deviation, you'd have a small standard deviation. So this here wouldn't show up in the standard deviation. Here, their distance from the target are all, or from the center are all about the same. The standard deviation would pretty much mirror your uncertainty. Okay, new material. This slide. Oh, poo. I forgot I have to do this. Yeah, yeah. This graphic covers basically everything we're covering for the next few days. So we have the scalars and vectors, we have the units, we have the definitions of velocity or speed, remember scalar versus vector, and acceleration. So let me write these things in here. I'll skip writing position. Everybody knows what position is, where something is. Distance is the difference or the ground traveled. Whereas displacement is the distance between start and end points. With direction. So it's a vector. The distance between the start and end points, it doesn't matter how you got there. The distance, the ground traveled, it matters how you got there. So the distance is path dependent. The displacement is not path dependent. Speed is distance over time, whereas velocity is displacement over time. There's obviously some glitching there of my pin. So those are our definitions for today. That's, that's all of the definitions we're shooting for today. Reading things. I talked about jargon. Here's another piece of jargon for you. That first letter looks like a triangle is a Greek capital D or delta. So that's a capital delta. And that capital delta in mathematical talk means the change in. Change in is always the final minus the initial. So change in position means the final position. Traditionally, we use X for position, so X final. Initial, we'll use an I for it. So delta X means X final minus X initial. The change in position. And displacement, remember, it doesn't matter what your path was. It's just the difference in the two. Sign conventions real quick because this does play into our problem we're going to do in a second. Traditionally, if we're doing a one-dimensional problem, we'll use X for the, for the motion. So that X is the position at any time. If we're doing two dimensions, X and Y will be perpendicular to each other. They have to be perpendicular, okay? We'll talk about Y later. And we'll use X as the horizontal, Y as the vertical, or X going left to right, Y going up down, with right being positive and up being positive. So those are conventions we tend to use. Adding vectors, which is what our problem is, so I had to get to here. When I was a youngster, like first grade, teachers were teaching us math and they taught us to add and subtract using the number line. How many people still learn, learn with the number line? Okay, good number. The number line method is how we add vectors graphically. 
And so you have, in this case, delta x1 is the first vector. Delta x1 is to the left. So it started at zero and went to the left its distance of three kilometers. The minus sign meant to the left because of our convention of positive to the right. And then delta x2 is plus two kilometers. Plus means going to the right. And so starting at the end of the first one, put the second one. And then the answer, what we call the resultant, is the vector that goes from the starting point to the ending point. So that there is Now these are vectors, so I'm going to put an arrow on the top that means they're vectors. And so if I look at my picture, or if you do simple math, minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1, we get that it's a 1 kilometer, no so units are listed, going to the left. So that's how we add vectors. And I will cover this more carefully in a later lecture. If you have more than one vector, you just keep going. When I was in graduate school, Dr. Walker taught physics, and he gave his students the first question on the first physics test, said, add these vectors up. And his vectors went, like that. What's the correct answer? Zero. Correct answer is zero because the resultant, as we call the result from adding the vectors, is the vector that goes from the starting point to the ending point. And since it ended where it started, it was zero. And I kid you not, now this class was about 200 students, but there were, I don't know, two or three students who spent the entire test period taking those vectors, breaking each one into its horizontal and vertical components, and adding them up. And that's the only problem they did in the entire test. And so those people had to drop the class. Does that mean they didn't know physics and didn't have a chance to pass the class? No, they made, they made a tactical error on taking the test. They forgot what the meaning is of adding vectors. And they just said, oh, I know how to do this mechanically. And I still don't think it was very fair because you're not really judging if they have the ability. You're just, you know, you need to be careful of this. It's good to do in practice when it doesn't count. Very bad to do on a test. But you just keep adding it. And I'm glad for the people who knew how to do that. So this is like our problem. I know I said this. I told you to stop me three minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You guys failed. Definition of average speed is the change in distance or the distance covered divided by time. So in this case here, we had a person that walked from their home to a store that's three kilometers away and walked back again. And it took them a half hour to do the entire trip. So for their average speed, we take the total distance they travel. What's the total distance going from home to the store and back? Six kilometers. So for the average speed, they went six kilometers and it took them 30 minutes. So six kilometers divided by 30 minutes. Three minutes is half an hour, right? So let's change it to hours. So six kilometers divided by a half hour is 12 kilometers per hour. That's their average speed. And that's not standard units, right? Standard units would have been meters because that's standard distance per second because that's the standard time. But it's still fine, 12 kilometers per hour. What's the average velocity? The average velocity is the change in displacement. Well, it's the displacement, excuse me, divided by time. What's the total displacement for the round trip? Zero. So what's the average velocity? Zero. zero. So they had an average speed of 12 kilometers per hour, average velocity of zero. Now it's your turn. Here's a graph to illustrate that. Position going out, coming back. Here's the velocity at any given time, the speed at any given time. Let's do our problem. So this is for your tables. A student runs from Prescott Hall to Holmes Lake Dam. That's one kilometer east. And then runs to the end of the dam, one mile north. Notice I only have one significant digit here in my numbers. I'll talk about significant digits, let's say Friday. For now, I'll just use two significant digits for your answer. One thing you should know is approximately 1.6 kilometers in one mile. Two questions, what was her average speed and what was her average velocity? 
The average velocity one is going to require you to do something we haven't done in class. So if you can't do that one, it makes sense. So work with your table. If you have questions, raise your hand. It's not you and you alone. So, yes. All right, three of you here. Do it so everyone can see right in here. And of course, explain your work. And we only have five minutes, so. We'll come draw on. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, this is okay. This is for average speed. Yeah, sorry. So 2.6 kilometers, and then you want it in hours. Right, so then that's 0 0.5 hours. And then if you divide that, it's 5.2 kilometers over hours. Okay. Now, just to make sure everybody knows, uh, probably everybody does, how did you get 2.6 kilometers? How did I get 2.6 kilometers? Yeah. I mean, it's very simple, just to make sure that you've said that. The, I create the... Well, it has one mile, one mile is yes. 1.6 kilometers. Okay, Thank so 1.6 kilometers plus one kilometer gave me 2.6. Just want to make sure that was clear. Right. Okay. So that was the average speed. And then for average velocity, you need the displacement over time. Uh, and then since you go one kilometer east and then 1.6 kilometers north, you need the displacement between the beginning and the end. And I just used the Pythagorean theorem to find that distance, which came out to be 1.89 kilometers. So that's the displacement that you need for the formula. So it's 1.89 kilometers over 0 0.5 hours, which equals 3.8 kilometers per hour. That was perfect. Thank you. So I imagine many of you were well on your way. If you weren't, well, the Pythagorean theorem, it's something we're going to be studying and doing a lot with. Trigonometry is, is a necessary skill that we will be working on. Notice he drew a picture there. The pictures, at least to a physicist's mind, are worth lots and lots. And he said use the Pythagorean theorem. That is square root of one kilometer squared plus 1.6 kilometers squared is what gave him the 1.89 kilometers for the hypotenuse, just for people who didn't remember that. Emily. Oh, do you want us to convert? Convert to the standard units? Okay, or? the units. If a problem asks for specific units, which is 98% of the time, then of course convert to those units. If it doesn't ask, you can go with what makes you happy. Okay. Unless it says use standard units, which is a way of saying convert to. Yeah. All right. Have a great day. I'll see you all on Friday. Remember, the lab reports are due Thursday evening before midnight. Thank you.